So, similar to Overlord, it's been quite a while since I last played Prototype. In fact, the PlayStation 3 was still current gen when I last played it, making it an interesting experience to go through it again, only half remembering certain plot beats and getting surprised by the others. I appreciate the kind of story it tells, because the underhanded, unethical experiments shown in game really aren't that far from actions taken by America and others in the past. They just did it with regular diseases instead of horrific bioweapons, mostly. Pair that with a character referring to the offending party in question as and Alex himself later saying explicitly that the Hope Idaho experiments were done to design a viral weapon that would target racial groups, and it can very quickly bring to mind a few real-world examples like Tuskegee or Unit 731. Prototype is a very grim, bleak, crapsack setting, and the writing is hardly subtle about it, and whilst at the time of their release Prototype and Infamous were pitted against each other due to similarities, Infamous ultimately has much stronger writing in my opinion, and I admit that I'm a much bigger fan of Infamous, so I am very much biased, but that doesn't mean I think Prototype isn't enjoyable on its own merits. It still has interesting moments, particularly regarding Mercer figuring out how it all started and how he feels about it, which we'll get to later because it's a massive spoiler. For the most part, however, I was more invested in finding all the web of intrigue entries because the lore itself was more engaging than the actual game plot. There is a slight caveat that if you're too zealous about finding these entries, you can accidentally see things before you should such as footage of Mercer using his armor power, even though you don't have that ability yet. But enough lead up, let's get started. We begin our journey with an introductory cinematic showing tendrils of visceral corruption spreading over a wrecked taxi as masked soldiers pass by, heads on a swivel for danger. Above them, Mercer monologues edgily about how he's the reason Manhattan looks like damp, meaty hell. He explains that three weeks ago, someone released a virus in Penn Station, and that he's going to make pay whoever turned him into this all-consuming, shape-shifting monstrosity in the shape of a human. The scene cuts back to the soldiers during night hours, whereupon they're approached by a nameless damsel in distress being chased by the infected. Dealing with the monsters, the soldiers promptly, and for no given reason, execute the crime woman, leaving her to slump to the ground with her clothes half torn off from the ordeal. Mercer spookily appears right behind her though, and proceeds to turn the soldiers into chunky salsa, displaying some of his abilities, including his most notable one. You're going to be doing this a lot and no one is going to learn any lessons from it. Cut to day and we're dropped headfirst into gameplay, giving us a more hands-on teaser of Mercer's full capabilities as he cycles through powers while fighting his way through a war-torn Times Square. His dialogue here feels a little out of place, like it's just there to be edgy and mysterious since this preview was quite late in the timeline and he knows a lot by this point. After introducing tentacles to everyone's insides, we get a cutscene of Mercer talking to a mysterious helmeted soldier about what to do next, and Mercer delivers this line. The last person responsible for all of this dies tonight. Now, I understand why the soldier is wearing a helmet that disguises his voice from a writing point of view. You don't want to give away who he is because it's a surprise for the player. However... From a narrative point of view, this character is almost never seen with a helmet at any other point in the game. He is really only wearing a helmet in this moment to disguise who he is to the player, because whenever they talk in person, he doesn't hide his face, even though they're out in the open and could be seen by the people he works for. Moving on. 
The game then yeets us 18 days backwards to the beginning of the outbreak, where two employees of the biological and genetic research company Gentech are about to perform an autopsy on- Hey, isn't that our special edgy boy? There are some small bits of personal info revealed about who Mercer is, but I can't concentrate on any of it because the most upsetting thing about this scene is that they were fully about to start the internal examination on him while he was completely clothed by going in through the torso with a scalpel. Like, that is not how you start an autopsy. Look. You examine from the outside of the body and work inwards. That means taking stock of outer characteristics like height, eye color, hair texture, etc. Noting what clothes and accessories the person is wearing and then removing everything until the body is completely bare for closer external examination. This part is to find and identify things like residue, injuries, scars or tattoos, that kind of thing. Sometimes x-rays and ultraviolet light is used to catch anything that may have been missed and then the internal examination begins by going through the torso. You f***ing heathens. Yes, I am heated about this and entirely because I ended up researching autopsies in order to write a moderately accurate one for a story I was doing. Fun times. The edgiest boy lurches up from the slab right before they can start cutting, however, scaring the scientists half to death as their cadaver staggers away, clearly disoriented and very confused. He somehow makes his way out the front doors of the Gentech building without any kind of internal security getting in his way, and hides behind a van just in time to see a Blackwatch kill team arrive. And I want you to keep in mind that these guys were called by the scientists to deal with Mercer. They are meant to be on the same side regarding understanding and dealing with this situation before it gets out of hand. Hmm. I wonder if they're the bad guys, actually. Mercer tries to leave only to get thoroughly ventilated, not that it slows him down for long when he realizes that taking 50 rounds to the chest did not end him. He jumps over the compound walls, destroys two helicopters chasing after him, and then collapses against an alley wall where a soldier hey. finds him, fires one, one round, and then immediately does the single biggest mistake anyone makes in this goddamn setting. He turns his back on the dangerous biological weapon. While he's not looking, Mercer stands up, breaks his neck, and wears a skin suit right before one of his friends comes around the corner. Mercer promptly slurps him up too, unlocking the Web of Intrigue, which is my favorite part of this game. The Web of Intrigue is a network of memories you unlock by consuming specific targets that pop up during story missions in sandbox gameplay. And the more you consume, the more fleshed out the story gets, providing piecemeal context for everything that's happening. The conspiracy levels of secrecy around Blackwatch, the Red Light and Black Light viruses, Elizabeth Green, and Pariah makes it all the more engaging to prize those secrets from the brains of those Mercer absorbs. We'll get into it more as we go, but for now, Lieutenant Charles Perry gives us a link to Dana, Mercer's sister, and we head off to find her being held at gunpoint in her apartment. She responds about as well as any of us would if someone we knew turned up after disappearing for a while and punched a hole through your captor's chest like it was made of rice paper. They talk while hiding in a nearby drain pipe, and we learn that before Mercer went dark, Dana was investigating the company he worked for at his request. It seems he was going way above his pay grade and investigating these super secretive shit at the highest levels of Gentech, which seems to have worked out super well for him. We'll start by going through the torso. They head to a friend of Dana's apartment where she'll be safe, even though you'd think that if Blackwatch can pretty much immediately find her apartment, they can find friends she would stay with, but don't worry about that. Dana points Mercer to his apartment to see if he can recover anything before Blackwatch does, and we see that he lived in the Upper East Side of Manhattan, so we know Gentech was paying him extremely well. He scans a wall of pictures and becomes fixated on one of him and a blonde woman he seemed close with, struck by a memory of her pulling on his arm looking distressed but unable to make out the words. He is promptly exploded by Blackwatch, showering glass and debris over terrified civilians below for the grand prize of just annoying him rather than doing any actual damage. After chasing down and consuming the suit who gave the order, we learn a sliver of context regarding what Mercer is, with the doctor dismissing the idea of bringing him in dead or alive because he doesn't think that either classification fits anymore. 
We cut back to the mystery soldier on the roof as Mercer recalls how revenge was the only thought in his head at the time that he could call his own, as the more he consumed, the louder his mind got with the thoughts, feelings, and memories of others. He elaborates that he thought if he could find the man running Gentech, he could find out what happened to him, who erased his past, and who to punish for doing this to him. Cryptically, he remarks that he wished he never found her, and we return to the game. Mercer nearly gives his sister a heart attack by sneaking up on her, and Dana explains that she's been searching through his laptop, which he apparently sent to her before whatever happened. Classified Gentech files point to a captive teenager called Elizabeth Green, of whom the company appeared to be experimenting on, but even though Mercer recognizes her face, he can't remember anything else about her. The cutscene switches to show us Blackwatch HQ, introducing General Randall, Colonel Taggart, and Captain Cross. Taggart is tasked with containing the population of Manhattan and setting up military safe zones through which travel will be heavily restricted, and is sternly told to just get on with it when he brings up the slight issue with there being at least a hundred thousand people in the first blue zone alone, never mind the rest of the island. Captain Cross is tasked with targeting Mercer directly, codenamed Zeus, and we return to gameplay outside the Gentech building. We discreetly disembowel and slurp up a high-ranking soldier and infiltrate the building, avoiding detection by Blackwatch's new virus-sniffing machines, which is funny because all they'd need to do to detect Mercer is look at the person who just casually jumped off a building without turning into red paste and start shooting. And I know that it would make it unplayable and annoying as hell if you were attacked every time you tried to traverse the city. It just feels very funny to me that enemies will fully see you sprint up walls or jump to the top of buildings without any alarm being raised, even though they are actively watching for someone displaying superhuman abilities. Anyway, we find Elizabeth Green just... waiting? She could have left before Mercer reached her, everyone on her cell's level was already dead, the door was open and she wasn't in a restraint, so what was she- Well then, after sipping on another soldier sangria, Mercer leads the hunters to a nearby military base to be contained, where as soon as you arrive, the camera points directly to a rack of rocket launchers because uh, you are like a little baby and can't do much to these things on your own yet. Now, this fight goes on for far longer than it should, in my opinion, owing to the fact that the hunters are very fast and will fold you like a cheap lawn chair if you let them at this stage in the game. On the plus side, consuming your first hunter unlocks your claws, which you can then use to pierce the fuel tanks and blow up the building. I mean, you can still use the rocket launchers, but... claws. Dana points him to Karen Parker, his ex-girlfriend and the woman in the photograph at his apartment, believing that Blackwatch will target her next, so we head off to make sure that doesn't happen. We head over to Karen's apartment and watch his software reboot in real time when she hugs him because the man has not experienced a single molecule of physical affection since he got up from that exam table. They'll need a military vehicle to leave the zone Karen's apartment is in, so we infiltrate the nearby base, and after a refreshing marine mimosa, Mercer learns how to drive an armored personnel carrier that can safely get Karen out of danger. We get another flash-forward conversation where Mercer remarks that he thought Karen would be able to help him understand what was going on and how to control it, and that freeing Green was a mistake, which... I mean, yeah, she's a major threat, but Mercer didn't exactly frick. Can we roll the clip? Mercer, you were a starting pistol at best, it's okay. 
Anyway, he comments that he had Karen, and believed they'd be able to stop this situation together, sending us back to the early days of the infection where Karen has been brought to her lab in East Harlem. Under the belief that she can treat the infection with samples from two dominant strains, we head out to get those samples, cracking open infected water towers that are acting like incubators for hunters, and collecting biological essence from a hive. Displeased with the pace of the outbreak, the military lands in force throughout Manhattan, with Blackwatch riddling their ranks, because the shady organization plans to use the Marines as both a cover and a scapegoat. In an effort to find out more about Dr. McMullen, the head of Gentech, Mercer heads out to infiltrate their latest and largest military base, and enjoys himself a juicy slice of paramilitary pastrami. This tasty morsel reveals the existence of UAVs designed to detect the virus in Mercer's body, and track down where he's been, which means those things need to stop existing before they find Karen or Dana. There's a brief flash forward to impress the importance of finding McMullen and Mercer's desperation to find who he was and what happened to make him this way, before we're thrown back into the game to destroy a slew of stationary detectors. We cut to a conversation between McMullen, Cross, and Randall, where the Doctor explains that by using the DNA sample Cross recovered, they've created a pathogen to infect Zeus, which he believes will generate a possible cure for the outbreak. I wonder how Cross got his hands on that. Cross makes the egregious mistake of referring to Mercer as a he, and Randall takes five full human seconds to react before grabbing Cross and yelling that Mercer isn't a he, it's an it. Cross is dismissed, and Randall then snidely remarks that the captain can't see the bigger picture while slapping a folder on the table titled Tactical Nuclear Weapons Protocols. So that might be a problem later. Back with Mercer, we continue chasing leads on McMullen and almost get him out in the open, only for him to pull out at the last second, leaving Mercer frustrated. He returns to Karen, who informs him she needs one more sample from inside a hive, and before he leaves, she tells him she's sorry things worked out this way. Not suspicious at all. Anyway, inside the hive, Captain Cross arrives, and whilst he displays super soldier levels of speed and endurance fighting Mercer, he ultimately has to retreat, causing Mercer to pursue him. It almost looks like it's lights out for Cross until he starts using Mercer's fragmented memory against him, bringing up Penn's station where the outbreak started. This makes Mercer fall to his knees in pain, leaving him open to getting injected with science juice. In a way, I feel sorry for you. Turns out Blackwatch already got to Karen and used her to bring him down, but don't worry, she's brutally killed in an elevator later even though her choices were say no to the shady paramilitary group or say no to the viral abomination in the shape of her ex-boyfriend, the bitch. But I didn't do that mission, so in my head she escaped. With Mercer incapacitated, Cross makes the mistake of turning his back to call in a containment device, which gives Mercer the opening to scuttle away. Unfortunately for us, the science juice prevents us from using weapon abilities, making combat a little more... complicated. Dana points us to Dr. Ragland and informs us that she's done more digging on the mysterious army town of Hope, Idaho. The town has been mentioned and brought up before in both the story and the web of intrigue as the place where this all started. Officially, the story was that it vanished off the face of the earth in 1969, nice, because of anti-government militia causing a bloody standoff with only one survivor, Elizabeth Green, who still looks like a college student at 55 years old. What happens next is a little bewildering to me, so I'm just going to let it play. Hope Idaho was an experiment. How could you possibly know that? The people I've killed, they're in me. I can hear them, see the things they've done. What the done. fuck are you talking about? I can understand it all. I'm supposed to do these things, but it's right. I can feel it. Find Ragland and ask him about McMullen. First of all, weird vibes. Second of all, did she not know something wild was going on when her brother turned up and shoved his fist into someone's chest right in front of her? Third of all, weird vibes. Like, I can't pin down what exactly feels off in this interaction, but something is. 
The long and short of it is that in the 60s, Blackwatch set up an army town with a diverse range of people, lied to them about the purpose, and infected them all with the red light virus. It lay dormant in everyone's bodies for a few years before a sudden and bloody descent into body horror chaos that resulted in the town being reduced to a scorch mark. The thing is, Gentech was allowed to research and study the red light virus, which eventually resulted in the black light virus that's currently infesting Mercer's body in the island of Manhattan, a strain many times worse than its predecessor. Fun stuff. Turning up at Dr. Raglan's morgue with a pulsating jelly tot on our back, he agrees to help deal with the parasite issue, which involves tracking down the bodies from Penn Station, protecting Dr. Raglan from waves of enemies while he gets samples from those bodies, and then safely escorting him back to his morgue while massive thing-like tentacles burst out of the ground trying to stop us. We then inject a hunter with a special syringe Ragland whipped up for us, use military equipment to track down the right hunter, beat the crap out of it, inject it, chase it down while the antibodies cook, and finally slurp up some healthy hunter hot pot so we can get this thing off Mercer's back. Not only does this fix the parasite problem, but it also unlocks the armor and blade powers, greatly increasing Mercer's combat and defense abilities. The armor is very useful for reducing damage in a fight, but it does come with drawbacks to your mobility, so whether you use it or not is up to you. Returning to Dana, the two share a touching moment as Mercer apologizes for freaking her out, and Dana reassures him that he's still her brother. Sensing this sweet emotional moment, Dana is immediately kidnapped by a leader hunter, a bigger, stronger variant able to command the others, because Green is sick of this sappy human bullshit. Our chase is cut short by military interference, leading us back to Ragland, who helps Mercer both track down and discover how to consume leader hunters, as their biology is set up in such a way to resist him. Consuming more leaders gives us flashes of what the infected hive mind is like, which I found very interesting since obviously they don't have clear-cut memories the way human targets do, but rapid snapshots and echoing voices. Still, Mercer is able to interpret the noise and track down where they've taken Dana, the Butler Library on the Columbia University campus, which Green has turned into an armored hive overgrown with throbbing meat moss. Gross. With no way to penetrate the core ourselves, we pretend to help the military until things go sideways, whereupon we steal their special thermobaric tank, using its deadly cannon to blast our way in. Armed with the same kind of concoction that nearly destroyed him, Mercer confronts Green inside the hive, gets some cryptic lines out of her, and then manages to inject her during a tussle. It doesn't quite have the same effect, however, seeing as Green purges it from her body immediately by throwing up and birthing a significantly more dangerous and unique hunter type, the Supreme Hunter. Upon defeating it, Mercer finds Dana and quickly gets her out of there, carelessly stepping in a puddle of hunter biomass on his way out. So that might be a problem later. Now, don't get me wrong here, I'm glad Dana can be safely brought to Dr. Ragland, but how in the hell is she not infected? She was inside the core hive, she was carried there by one of the infected, and somehow rendered unresponsive by them. The explosive spread of the outbreak in just a few days pretty clearly indicates how frightfully contagious it is, and yet, she's fine. Ragland agrees to watch over Dana and hands Mercer an annotated map that was mysteriously delivered, pointing him to various drop points around the city, and with that final piece of aid rendered, he and Dana proceed to completely vanish from the story going forward. They are simply not brought up again. At one of the drop points, Mercer has his first conversation with the mystery soldier, where he's informed that he isn't human, he's the black light virus Gentech created after their experiment with red light virus in the 60s went sideways. Our mystery friend then warns him about a weapon Blackwatch is planning to use against him, which turns out to be a combination of super soldiers they've somehow created via viral infections. 
and an aerosolized antiviral agent called Blood Tox, which is harmless to humans but poison to blacklight, which Mercer finds out the hard way when he infiltrates a debrief, only to begin coughing because the room has been full of Blood Tox from the start. Quick question, the commander remarks that the soldiers in the room have been breathing it this whole time, but all of them are wearing gas masks. Mercer is mimicking the structure of a gas mask as part of his disguise, so how is it getting into anyone's lungs, or is it effective on contact, and if so, why even point out that they're breathing? You know what, I'm giving this too much thought, carry on. After fleeing, we get a flash forward where Mercer talks about the divisive effect learning about his lack of humanity had on him, freeing and killing him in equal measure. He isn't really Dr. Alexander J. Mercer, employee of Gentech. We've been playing as the virus this whole time, the same virus running rampant across the city, given form and personality simply because that doctor was the first infected. That doctor being the very one who engineered the red light virus into the black light virus, proud of making it so much deadlier. With Mercer determined to find out who unleashed the virus and subsequently created him, we return to gameplay to track down McMullen for the last time. But before we can even get to him, we need to... Break Blackwatch's hold on southern Manhattan by disrupting their blood tox deployment, ensuring those areas are under threat, then infiltrate and help Blackwatch's mission to pump blood tox below ground where the virus and Green have retreated, and finally defend the pump until Green finally one-wing angels her way out of the ground for a deeply unpleasant boss fight I was relieved to be done with. Once Green is consumed and the infected are no longer fighting with the same singular focus, i.e. their forces are now headless and significantly weakened, Blacklight decides that now is the time to completely pull out and nuke the island of Manhattan. Okay. We cut to Captain Cross and his soldiers holding off the infected at a pier somewhere in the city, and General Randall is a little upset that Colonel Taggart ordered a general retreat without any such order from him. Urged by Cross to get out of Dodge, Randall moves Blackwatch Command to the aircraft carrier Reagan and orders him to bring Taggart in with only four hours to get it done. That might be a slight problem, however, as the infected overrun the area. Luckily for Mercer, Captain Cross is just built different and survives the battle. He casually drops that Mercer is becoming resistant to blood tox and tells him to attack the main production facility head on and pretend to be captured, thus ensuring that he will be brought directly to McMullen. Despite all of the everything these people have seen Mercer accomplish, this goes off without a hitch and Mercer ends up cornering McMullen alone in a lab. It's here we find out that not only is the protagonist a personified virus, but that all of this carnage and horror started because the man whose name and face he wears decided that if he was going down, the entire human race was going down with him. Alexander J. Mercer is the one who released the blacklight virus on Manhattan, and even the aberrant viral monstrosity who eats people is disgusted by that act. But there are still secrets to learn about Red Light and Hope Idaho, because when Blackwatch found Elizabeth Green at the center of it all, she was pregnant, and what happened to her child is a complete unknown. As McMullen raises the gun, Mercer remarks that there's nothing the Doctor can do to hurt him, but knowing that, McMullen chooses to introduce his brain to some fresh air and denies Mercer the chance to consume his memories. Should have just eaten him when you had the chance. At our final drop point, Captain Cross, our mystery friend on the inside, finally shows up in person. With General Randall as the last person who knows exactly what went down at Hope, Cross convinces Alex to help him stop the nuclear strike on Manhattan by capturing and consuming Taggart. This involves destroying all his air support and forcing him to run before he's ready, leading to a very, very frustrating sequence where you are being fired at from 16 different angles with rockets, ensuring your ability to actually get inside his tank and consume the bastard is strained at best. Regardless, once Mercer can finally look like Taggart, he and Cross are brought onto the Reagan where Randall executes the Colonel on the spot. He then threatens Cross with the same for daring to ask about their men still on Manhattan regarding the nuclear strike, but his military bravado collapses pretty quickly when he turns around to see Mercer. 
Enjoying a delicious bite of General Gingerbread, we see Randall's callous, scorched earth attitude towards what happened at Hope, ensuring nothing gets in or out and following through on the orders to liquidate the entire population, with two exceptions. We see him take a newborn directly from Elizabeth Green's body, causing her to attack and wound his arm. Not taking any chances with the red light virus, Randall immediately took a cleaver and cut his arm above the wound site, which seems to have worked considering he kept going afterwards. But that child isn't elaborated on any further in the main story, only through the web of intrigue do we learn that his codename is Pariah, and he was moved to a black site many years ago for some research program that resulted in six deaths by Pariah's hand, despite the fact that all imagery of him is that of a very young child, and he exhibits no signs of infection, testing negative for all strains found in his mother. We can't linger on this mystery for long though, because... Remember how Captain Cross's position was overwhelmed by the infected? Yeah. Do you also remember how the Supreme Hunters started to reform but then never seemed to come up again? Yeah. It turns out Cross is not built different and the Supreme Hunter is here to eat our ass so it can survive the nuclear strike. At least buy us dinner first. Now, when I played this forever ago, I thought Cross was Pariah, thanks to us learning about him from Randall and then immediately cutting to Cross changing into a monster. I hadn't unlocked all of the intrigue memories yet, but the scene of his position getting overwhelmed from the POV of a towering monster, the web of intrigue discussing Pariah with more detail, it just dismantles the idea, and the Supreme Hunter reforming, it, it doesn't add up to Cross being Pariah. Defeating the Supreme Hunter again, Mercer takes a helicopter and flies the live nuke out to sea just far enough to save Manhattan, but not in time to avoid being caught in the blast himself. His last act being to die protecting the city, his namesake almost destroyed in an act of unwavering spite. But it turns out that, much like the Supreme Hunter, our walking bioweapon can regenerate from even the most grievous bodily harm. It's at this point that the player is dropped into free roam where they can finish up all the side quests, collect all the landmarks and hints, and generally cause whatever havoc they please. One might assume that the sequel to this game would be Mercer searching for Pariah and trying to bring the rest of Blackwatch down because this is a group that fully tried to create a racially targeted bioweapon in the 60s and perhaps should not be allowed to continue existing. Mercer seems to have developed an actual conscience by the end thanks to his assimilation of so many people and judged his namesake's actions as unforgivable, so he clearly holds some value in saving humanity in general and views willfully unleashing biological havoc to be a bad thing. Well, forget about that because in the sequel he's the most generic megalomaniac and wants to infect the whole world so he can wipe out all pain and conflict and give humanity one mind, one goal, etc, etc. And why? Because in a comic they released between games, he brutally traveled around the world to restore his lost faith in humanity, and without failure, encountered only the worst people the planet had to offer, up to and including getting his heart broken by a woman he was attracted to, explicitly telling him she only cares about herself in a nihilistic edgelord I want to burn down the world message so heavy handed it has its own gravitational pull which I am definitely not bitter about or completely exhausted with at all. All that being said, I enjoyed the game overall. While some parts can be frustrating, it's still fun to travel around the city, infiltrate bases, screw with the military, and especially to hunt down web of intrigue targets, my favorite activity. I used to think that they were dispersed randomly amongst the crowds, but no, they have their own sections in the city they show up in, and God help you if it's a red zone, because even though I love this part of the game, I hated getting targets in infected areas. The chaos makes it extremely easy for something to kill the target before you have a chance to reach them. There's a tiny grace period between them being killed and you no longer being able to grab and consume them, and many times you will not make it, forcing you to leave and come back later. Despite my misgivings about Mercer's role in the sequel, I am genuinely curious as I never got around to actually playing it myself, so I look forward to covering it. 
In the meantime, I will start work on the first Crisis game and throw up a channel poll where you can decide what video I do after, Overlord 2 or Prototype 2. Whatever wins will get done first and the loser goes second. Special shout out to my patrons who are all very handsome people, and if you'd like to support this kind of content, check out the link in the description. Don't forget to drink your water, take your medication, touch grass if you're feeling particularly adventurous, and I will see you all next time.